the first little object I think that really did hold my attention was a lock. It was a very decorative affair and I only really saw it on Christmas time and I remember as a very small child handling it and wondering at it. This was a little brass object of like a kind of a lion and the loop in the lock it went through the head of the, the creature and became a tongue. Anyway it had a special key that you could undo and there you have this, this, this extraordinary lock. So that was my first kind of object, if you like, that I kind of appreciated. I was born and brought up in Wales, in rural Wales. It was a coal mining district. Most people were kind of makers, craftspeople, if you like. They would never, ever have thought of themselves as such. But when I think about my home and when I was a child, and the way my mother worked and made things, rugs, for example, there was no way they could afford to go out and buy a carpet. And so they would make rugs. All of it very well made, as I remember. And there was nothing unusual in all of that. When I first started at the Crafts Council, it wasn't called the Crafts Council, it was called the Crafts Advisory Committee. And my job was to curate the shows. And it couldn't have been a better time, really, all the graduates were coming out of the colleges at that time, new, fresh, thinking. There we were, ready to show their work. I like to show work with plenty of space and just one or two pieces give them room to breathe and so you really, really can focus on work. The maker's eye wasn't like that. The maker's eye was like very full, but you had these rich rooms that would just, just absorb you. All I felt was that I shouldn't be doing it. I mean, okay, I would be great in, it in as much as that I would make sure that everything was going right and the graphics and the installation and all that would work, but I wanted the makers to select it. You know, I want a mixture of gender, I want a mixture of ages, I want a mixture of pretty well everything. I wanted the selectors to, to select not just work that they know really well, their own subject. I wanted the selectors to look outside of that, to think of other crafts. And that could also tip into the fine arts, it could tip into engineering, it could tip into science. So you'd have a very diverse show, but coming together by the characters that selected it. And there were something like 13 or 14 selectors, if you like. It was a hell of a show, it really was. And the public poured in there. When I look at new work, the first thing I look at is the idea, what is being said here. And I do like to have my own ideas challenged. But as I say, it isn't just something that's going to be very aggressive. It has to say something. It's got to be said with real commitment. I bought a piece of Alison Britton's recently from her show. It's an astonishing piece. It fascinates me. I get absolutely absorbed by it. She, she has called it plain. Plain it ain't. I mean, it really, it's so... Complex, it's astonishing. As I say, I look at it long and hard and then turn it a little bit and how oh, it changes. And there is something direct to my gut that comes right at me when I see it immediately. And then, given more time, I see other things. The rough edges, the, the bendy lines are part of its character. If they were all straight and pristine, it would die. Whereas Shen Mizumi, we're showing a, a bench of his in the show. Absolutely superb, immaculate, minimalist piece with the most wonderful, simple curves. If that would kind of wobbly or if the lines weren't perfect, it wouldn't work. It would look dreadful. There was no good looking for an Alison Britain pot that has this perfection about it because that's not what it's about. There are certain times when things can be killed by being too well made. 
This pop's by Angus Sutty. This piece he calls Teapot. And I knew nothing about it until it was presented to me when I left the Crafts Council. But it has a function. You enter into a sort of relationship with something like that. And every time you use it, you feel the weight, you feel the quality, you feel this immense kind of relationship with somebody's work. And it's a one-off piece. There isn't another part quite like that. This is absolutely made by hand. I mean, this immense collection that the Crafts Council owns is, is phenomenal. It must register as one of, if not the, collection in the UK of 20th century craft. We were putting on exhibitions, bringing together work, and we wanted to show our appreciation to the craftspeople for what they were doing. No better way than doing that is to buy things. So we bought quite a lot of the work that we showed. We didn't for a moment think we were building a collection. It's just things of, that we bought, as I say, to acknowledge their talent and because, well, they needed that support. I think it's very personal, really, how you respond to the work, whether it's good or not. You know, something that I might be nuts about might not be of any interest to you. And that's fair. The great thing about the crafts for me, and I think this is a truism, is that you can start off, you know, whatever age you are, looking at craft, pots, glass, jewellery, but you can learn from those things, you can move on to other things. And then gradually you can move on and start looking at paintings and sculpture and architecture and then going back and then looking at the pot that you bought and you think, wow, isn't that great? You know, because your eyes are open. Oh, it's, I, I can't imagine living without it being that way. For example, I'm obsessed by trees. I love them. My father he would talk about trees and take me and show me trees through the various seasons. Towering things, you know, like giants and always on the move. And you start living like that, the world becomes incredibly rich. I was having dinner with a friend some years ago and at the end of the meal we had coffee. Inside my cup, it was a surrealist Max Ernst. So I said to the waiter, I'd like to buy this cup and saucer. And so he gave it to me, of course. And if Max Ernst were alive, he would weep because it's his. We live now in a, in a global culture, don't we? What's happening in, in, in the UK, and what's happening in Germany, what's happening in America, and Australia, or they were very, very similar in so many ways, all wearing the same clothes, all listening to the same music. I think that's one of the great things about really good craft. They won't be the same anywhere else. These are unique objects.